to speak, but you're going to have to hear me for a second. So I'm Regine Gawazi. I'm the director of this office, uh, the Center for Anxiety in Brooklyn office. Um, we provide CBT treatment for children, adolescents, and adults um, for anxiety disorders and related disorders, OCD, mood, um, PCIT for children. We do a lot of cool stuff. If you have any questions about what we do, feel free to talk to any of the staff after this is over. Um, this lecture is actually part of our community education series, which is a free monthly-ish, really every six weeks, um, lecture. But uh, this time we decided to do something di different by bringing in Dr. McKay, which we're really super excited about. Um, he is a, a professor of psychology at Fordham, as well as a professor, uh, uh, adjunct professor of psychiatry at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And a, and a past president of ABCT. Um, he's published a lot, right? Is that there? Um, <laughs> um, a lot. <laughs> um, I think your bio says over 200 conference presentations, over 170 journal articles and book chapters, and 200 conference presentations. Um, his main focuses of research are OCD and um, disgust, but that's not what he's talking about today. We actually had the idea of this talk when he co-edited um, the ABCT journal of behavior therapist, sorry, it's not behavior therapist, but behavior therapist on um, the biomedical model and whether or not there was support for uh, me mental health um, issues, sorry, I said that, it's in, you know, in biology and genetics, what the support was. Yeah. So um, David Rossman, who's our founder and couldn't be here, said, we should bring him in and give a talk in Brooklyn. So that's what we did. We're really so happy to have you, okay. and take it away. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's nice to be here this evening. Um, so as the title suggests, my main focus for this evening is just to really highlight for people and to inform the community a little bit about how medication and psychiatry really is intended to work and also what some of the findings are as to how effective some of these things might be when it comes to uh, treatment for children or for adults um, because I think there are some assumptions that we might have that may not really be consistent with what research suggests and what actual practice is intended to entail. Uh, so that's basically the thrust and as Regine mentioned, um, my, area, my substantive area of research is OCD uh, and other anxiety disorders, and those conditions are ones where people frequently uh, seek out treatment with medication. And so I'm very familiar with this issue just from direct client care that I uh, engage in regularly. And more recently, my interest has been related to uh, trying to identify ways in which people might be uh, better served by understanding the way medication really works and being able to ask better questions of their providers so that they don't end up getting over-medicated or that they get at least proper medication because frequently there's a gap between the research and what people actually get. So before I get really into the content, I feel like there's a couple of disclaimers that I have to get out of the way. First of all, um, this talk is not intended for me to just basically bash biological bases of psychiatry globally. So that would be a little bit too easy. I come in as a psychologist and I go, yeah, psychiatry is terrible and that's crazy. I'm not going to do that. Um, so I don't want you to misunderstand that. I also want to make clear uh, that this is not an affirmation of a core idea of Scientology. Uh, so I'm not uh, rejecting psychiatry like uh, uh, Tom Cruise might, or any other religious position that rejects psychiatry. So I feel like that's important for us to clear the air on. OK, so <clears throat> what are some common problems that are treated with medication? So in children, uh, attention problems. Uh, we widely recognize uh, and understand right now that attention deficit uh, disorder is a condition that in children is getting a lot of recognition, and um, it's frequently one that is uh, medicated. General behavior disturbance, uh, so parents with kids who have disruptive behavior problems, frequently they're brought to their pediatricians uh, with the desire to have that problem medicated. Uh, anxiety and fear, so the medication is frequently used for anxiety and fear in uh, kids. Obsessive compulsive problems, repetitive behaviors, uh, intrusive thoughts that kids might report and complain about. Uh, depression, frequently the uh, condition that is uh, treated with medication. And eating or feeding problems. So I listed these. These are all 
areas where medications are currently on the market and approved uh, by the FDA for uh, prescribing to children in order to treat these problems. Uh, and in adults, you'll see some comparisons that look very similar to what we see in kids. Depression, uh, very widely treated with medication. Uh, anxiety and fear, so a very high probability if you go to a uh, medical professional, they will suggest medication if you're complaining about anxiousness. Uh, obsessive compulsive problems, again, like I mentioned for children. Attention problems. Uh, increasingly, adults are seeking medication for attention problems, just like they might seek for their children. Uh, eating disorders and body image disturbance, also frequently treated with medication, and psychosis. So all of these problems are ones where the FDA has medication on the market that's approved for treating any of these categories. But you might ask a question, well, why, why treat this with medication to begin with? Why would we believe going into this that this is a problem that should be treated with drugs? Well, one of them is that for whatever reason, this is a problem that you feel needs to be addressed right now. And our experience with medication for other problems is usually one where it's treated with that approach for a problem that's right presently there, and you would go and you would get it dealt with with medication. You might not have to go back to the office for the, you know, or maybe for a follow-up visit uh, a little while later. So the instantaneous need for it to be addressed is one that is uh, compelling for medication. <clears throat> Virtually all other doctors that you visit will prescribe medication for your problem. So it seems like, well, why would I not do that for this as well? <clears throat> and right now there's a lot of advertising that suggests that you should treat these problems with medication. So we're going to get a little bit more into that in a second. So when the issue of medication comes up and you're asking yourself, I may need to get this problem addressed, you should ask yourself a, que a couple of questions. Uh, in order to make a decision in an informed way about whether you should take uh, drugs for the problem. What did it take for me to finally make the call? Like, what was the, what was the breaking point that led to this? And is it a problem that if you treat it with medication, will it be worth it uh, in light of the things that I'm about to describe that are consequences of medication? Or maybe would a different approach be warranted? And what do I expect and how quickly do I expect it? So these are. These are, this is an important question, and one that you might be surprised is a hard one to answer, because this is usually what's going on. At the moment when you make the call, uh, the feeling is that I'm going to go to the doctor and I'm going to get instant gratification. And you'll see this, uh, this cartoon illustrates the point well. Uh, the zero mile fun run, runners to your mark, get set, go. Okay, now get your t-shirts. Uh, so you know, that is the kind of thing that we kind of anticipate with medication. The um, notion underlying this is the so-called silver bullet theory. The silver bullet theory or the magic bullet theory is that if I go to the doctor because I'm struggling with this particular behavioral or emotional problem, or my kid is struggling with a behavioral or emotional problem, the doctor will prescribe something that will make it go away, that it will really require no additional effort on my part. Uh, and so that is something that you might expect as part of your desire to get medication for uh, this particular problem. I mentioned the thing about advertisements, and that's an important one because culturally here in the United States, the US is kind of a unique location when it comes to psychiatric medication. Uh, in 1985, uh, legislation was passed that loosened the restrictions on how medication could be promoted, and it was when uh, that was the first year that direct-to-consumer advertising for medication was permitted. Uh, so you have um, 30 years now of history behind us with this being available, but it didn't happen right away. In 1985, when this legislation was passed and it allowed for the loosening of regulations, there was a lot of very strict rules still in place on the extent to which side effects had to be reported in that same advertisement. And so if there was, let's say, a television commercial in 1985 airing for a psychiatric medication, probably about 45 to 50 percent of that airtime would have to be devoted to them listing all the side effects. In 1997, that changed. The FDA further relaxed the rules where they really only had to report the most common or the most serious side effects. <clears throat> so that changed it rather radically because now television and other print advertisements that would be directed towards consumers didn't have to be as lengthy. And so at that point, 
uh, we have been under near constant barrage with advertisements for medication. Let me ask the question, how many of you watch, let's say, morning television, like Good Morning America or The Today Show? How many of you guys? Nobody watches this? <laughs> okay. How many of you watch TV? <laughs> okay, and how many of you have seen medication ads on TV like for psychiatric medications? You've all seen them. And so you know that they'll, they'll advertise it usually in a very particular way. And the, and the marketing is to try, obviously, to make it appealing. Oh, you're depressed. So they show someone kind of downtrodden. And then, oh, take Paxil. And all of a sudden, like, the clouds lift. And then near the end, they'll say, side effects include. And they'll list off several side effects, usually. Those are not the complete list of side effects. That's because of this FDA rule. They only list them. It's only a partial list. And it's uh, a list of the ones that are most likely or most severe. So that's, that's a, an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and this has had a tremendous impact on the public attitude towards medication. So right now, many people seek medication for uh, their ailment, even if they would prefer a non-medication alternative if they thought that it would help their problem. And so psychologists, because they're, there is the so-called big pharma, so since the advent of um, the FDA ruling and all the advertisements, the shorthand for the pharmaceutical industry, as you might be aware, is called big pharma, there's no comparable big therapy. Uh, that is out there hitting the streets and advertising the effectiveness of psychological or other interventions. So as a result of it, most people end up getting prescribed medication for uh, emotional and behavioral problems. Um, and this issue with advertisement and advertising is a controversial practice. And pretty regularly, the World Health Organization takes a close look at this. Uh, the U.S and New Zealand are the two countries where advertising of medication directly to consumers is permitted currently. Uh, and in New Zealand, the problem is not quite as acute as it is here because they still have the requirement for a more detailed listing of side effects in their direct-to-consumer advertising. So this is a controversial issue, and it's one that uh, is an important one for us to reckon with. And so I thought this meme, which, uh, like a lot of internet memes, uh, there are many that are inaccurate. I checked to make sure that this one ac was accurate, so it's not like I just shared it kind of wildly on Facebook. Um, but even though the U.S. population is only about 5% of the world, uh, we consume 60% of psychiatric medications in the world. So this is a very heavily medicated country uh, with psychiatric drugs. Now, the degree to which that's an appropriate level of medicating is something that we should really call into question. And here's where we should really ask those questions is, you, may, you know about medication, you've heard about medication, uh, and you know the things that they're treated for, they're used to treat, but you may have less detailed information about side effects. And if you knew more about the side effects, you might have more questions that you would want to ask about whether you should take them. So let's start with, as far as usage, um, as I mentioned, psychiatric medication usage has risen really dramatically in the last 20 years. So correspondingly with that change in the rule in 1997, dramatic increase in usage. And in particular, the highest increases have been in children. Uh, so with the advent of ADD medications, attention deficit disorder medications, children have been medicated at a much, much higher rate. Um, and that has been actually also evolving. It's gone from there being mostly uh, attention deficit oriented medications to now more, uh, more serious medication, like uh, antipsychotic medications, which are not used for psychosis necessarily in children. They're used for behavior problems. Um, the reason for that, by the way, is that um, antipsychotic medications have an important side effect of tiredness. And so if you have a child that has a lot of behavior problems, what better way to stop the behavior problems than to make them sleepy? Um, you know, you just kind of chill. And then um, it's harder for kids to act up and do things that are problematic. So we see this happening uh, in a widespread way. Uh, also, high increases in women. So women are getting more uh, medication than they had been previously as well. Uh, but in general, so even though these are the two groups where the increases in uh, prescribing are the highest, it is also across the board for all, uh, all groups, adults and men, it is also way up. And for all classes of psychiatric medication. Now let's take a look at the typical side effects. So this is in the broadest stroke typical side effects for all classes of psychiatric medications. They are numerous and they include the following. Uh, most psychiatric medications have weight gain associated with them. In fact, almost all. Uh, there, there are a couple of exceptions here and there, but virtually all have weight gain. Uh, most of them 
have some possible risk of blurry vision. Uh, some have uh, risk of sexual dysfunction, which often leads to mm -hmm. noncompliance. Uh, and in a subgroup of them, but a very popular subgroup of medication, increased agitation and suicidal ideation is actually quite common. Um, or there is a risk. In fact, <clears throat> this one class of medications that many of you probably have heard of, the um, SSRIs, the Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, um, they carry what's called a black box warning, which means that that group of medications, uh, when prescribed to adolescents, Incre are considered a, a risk for uh, increasing suicidal ideation. Uh, if you're interested, as an aside, if you're interested in a very good uh, story, uh, a book length treatment of the history of leading to that black box warning appearing on those medications, you should read the book by Allison Bass called Side Effects. Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, and, um, uh, so it's called Side Effects, and the author is Allison Bass. BASS. Uh, it's an unbelievably uh, compelling read, and um, and she's not a psychiatrist; she's a journalist. Uh, so um, sometimes the best stuff comes from outside the profession, and uh, I would I would highly recommend it. All right. So, given all this, you have every reason to expect medication to help, right? Based on what you've heard uh, in advertisements, which you've been exposed to repeatedly, and at times when you might not be paying really close attention, but it's just kind of there in the periphery. You hear, oh yeah, Seroquel, you know, oh yeah, Paxil, you know, you hear that message from the television because if the TV's on while you're doing some other activity. You've gone to a doctor, a medical professional, who has said to you, oh, you seem to be struggling with depression or anxiety, why not try medication? You talk to a couple of friends who said, I took it, or my son took it, or my daughter took it, it helped them. So you hear this message kind of permeate the, your, your world around you, you have every reason to think it would help. So the medical establishment often says so. You've seen countless ads extolling the virtues. Uh, and even psychologists are trying to get the right to prescribe. So here's a group of people whose main professional activity is not prescribing, and they would like to prescribe. And that's been policy for 20 years now from the American Psych uh, Psychological Association has been the effort to try and get prescription privileges for uh, psychologists. So it sounds like you really should start taking drugs, <laughs> right? That seems like that's the message. And yet, uh, these are not really problems like other problems. So psychiatric disturbance is not a set of problems that really fit neatly into the same category as problems that we associate with being treated by uh, medicine and other, and other domains. For example, the diagnoses that we currently rely on, so if you go to, let's say, any, any of the people that work in this practice, and they give you a diagnosis code from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manuals, which, manual, which is now in the fifth edition, <coughs> those diagnoses do not have known medical bases. None of them do. Uh, and that probably is a surprise to you. How many of you have heard that before? How many of you ever heard someone say, you've heard that? One person, one, two, three. A small group of you have heard someone somewhere say, the diagnoses in that book do not have a medical basis. That's kind of an amazing thing because it is intended to be a medical book. They're diagnoses. They're supposed to theoretically represent a brain level problem. So. How are those diagnoses determined anyway? Does anybody know the story of how diagnoses are established in, like how they how they come up with the diagnostic categories in the DSM? Does anybody know the story on how that happens? Regional? Huh? The regional DSM? Yeah. How, how is it developed, you know? We got together at a meeting and threw ideas together. Exactly. It's committee. It's developed by committee. Rather than, let's say, how do they determine uh, other medical diagnoses? It's based upon a biological theory that says here's this entity and then it's demonstrated to be valid. This is demonstrated to be valid based upon us saying it's valid. So it's sort of a backwards way of establishing it and it has not then in turn resulted in a biological understanding of problems. So that's you know something that's unusual. By the way what I'm saying now uh, if there was a psychiatrist in the room they probably would recognize this as accurate. I would not be getting disagreement from psychiatry if there was a medical doctor in the room right now to hear this talk. 
So that's, and, and you know, I've gone to several meetings where there are psychiatrists in attendance, and they will say, the things I'm talking about now are not controversial to psychiatry. Uh, there are no established genetic links for psychiatric problems. So there's been a lot of money spent on genetic research for a whole host of psychiatric problems, and there has not yet been a definitive genetic link for any of them. Uh, so there's a, a very well-known geneticist in psychiatry named Gerald Smoller, who gave a talk on this topic at the Anxiety and Depression Association of America two years ago. Uh, and he opened with that very statement. So the one that I just made now, I was basically paraphrasing a prominent geneticist. Okay, so again, this is, this is something that is very well known. And this is based on data collected on maybe 200,000 or more patients across different diagnostic groups. And finally, the neurotransmitters that are supposed to be the targets for medication are generic. And what do I mean by that? So, uh, you know, you guys have heard about gen uh, neurotransmitters? Right, everybody knows what you're, okay. So, so let's say if we take the SSRIs that I mentioned before, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So that class of medications, the generic aspect of it is that those are approved for the treatment of depression, all of the anxiety disorders, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders, which now are in a separate category in the current DSM that we are living with, uh, eating disorders, those are pretty different categories, right? Eating disorders, OCD disorder, uh, OC disorders, which are now there's more than one, uh, anxiety disorders, and depression. So that sounds pretty generic. It's sort of like aspirin, right? We take aspirin for a whole bunch of reasons that have to do with diffuse bodily pain. Here is this generic set of medications that are in the same class. Uh, and we could say that for a lot of different medications that are currently used psychiatrically. So they're generic, they're not definitively related to specific biological bases. <clears throat> There's also a very big disconnect between how research is done and sort of the ideal circumstances that are intended to give proof to the findings supporting medication use and then how it's actually done. It's a very, very big difference. So when you hear about clinical research for uh, psychiatric medication, most of them are either, they're from eight to 20 weeks that the medication is administered. In actual practice, it's very, it's highly variable, but typically people are prescribed medication for more than one year. Excuse me. Um, the dosing that you would get if you were in a clinical trial is very controlled, very carefully controlled, and you're evaluated usually weekly, so you'd meet with the doctor who would ask you very careful questions about side effects and how you're doing and improvement, versus the typical experience psychiatrically for uh, people who are not in a trial, it's pretty uncontrolled, uh, your visits to the doctor might range anywhere from monthly to biannually, maybe less frequently. I've, I've had clients come to me where they see their psychiatrist once a year. That's pretty low frequency if you're taking medication. <clears throat> Most of the research has definitively shown that you get symptom relief, um, but typically symptoms return when medication is discontinued. Uh, and so you see really kind of the same thing in actual treatment, so everyday non-clinical trial treatment. Uh, it's typically prescribed by a psychiatrist in clinical research, um, but it's prescribed in actual practice by a wide range of uh, professionals. Behind, second most likely prescriber of psychoactive uh, psychiatric medications uh, behind psychiatrists or general practitioners. And it's, and it's actually like pretty close, too. It's not like uh, they're a distant second. Uh, in that foot race, if they were actually racing more than zero, zero miles, um, they would be nipping at psychiatry's heels. Uh, and, and this is the important thing that most people are unaware of, is that um, psychiatric medications are associated with actually higher medical costs in the long term. So people don't usually inquire about these issues. So <clears throat> I mentioned by way of example SSRIs as one class of medications that people are commonly prescribed. There's another class of medications that, I, that are being increasingly prescribed to children I mentioned before. They're called the uh, atypical antipsychotic medications. Um, and atypical antipsychotics are often used for behavior disorders. Kids who are uh, you know, misbehaving at home, really not paying attention well in school, and doing things that are really problematic behaviors. Uh, and, and kids are often getting this class of medications. 
Um, that class of medication also carries with it a uh, very high weight gain and a risk of developing diabetes. Um, you might not be aware of this. One of those medications, the makers of one of those medications, uh, settled out of court, but it was public. Uh, the amount that they settled with the state of Arkansas for $1.3 billion, Johnson & Johnson, because of what they call off-label usage. So the reason why I should, I'll, let me spend a moment on that. Um, in children, usually the research on effectiveness for treatments for children usually lags behind that for adults. And there's some good reasons for that. One of them has to do with, um, you know, we would subject ourselves to a research trial, but we wouldn't subject our children. And so, you know, there are some gaps in how uh, effectively we can collect data on kids because parents have some reluctance to uh, do this with them. So the research always trails, but at the same time, medication comes on the market that we might believe would help problems that occur in children that look similar to what happens in adults. And so medications might get utilized even though they're not really approved yet, but you could actually prescribe it. So the antipsychotics are in that category. There was a lot of what they call off-label usage. So it's being prescribed legally, but it was not through research proven or demonstrated to be helpful for the problem. And so in many states, this has uh, led to incredible increases in medical costs. So the reason why the state of Arkansas and other states as well are in the middle of this kind of legal battle with Johnson & Johnson is that Medicaid suddenly had to absorb incredible costs for diabetes care, other obesity-related care, uh, and other problematic health issues in children who were receiving high doses of these medications off-label. Uh, and Johnson & Johnson was promoting its use. So that's why Johnson & Johnson got tangled up in it and it wasn't just doctors prescribing. Johnson & Johnson was saying, yeah, we haven't really shown this to help, but yeah, we're cool with it. It's okay if you do it. Uh, and representatives were encouraging its use. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, and then I have a little citation. So if you're interested, this was, uh, a lot of this was documented in an article in the British Journal of Psychiatry. Okay. So now, all of this makes it sound like, well, I do get medication for other problems, though. Why can't I do this? So you might still be a little skeptical. So I want to highlight for you the fact that other branches of medicine don't necessarily behave this way. So in hypertension, for example, so we always think of high blood pressure, that's a medical problem, definitively a medical problem, right? You go to the doctor, they put the thing on your arm, they test it, like, wow, look, it's really high. The best practices for medical doctors is to first recommend, before prescribing antihypertensive medication, is to prescribe changes in diet and exercise. So medical doctors are, they understand that the first thing you should change is your behavior. So that's, that's kind of a striking issue that we often uh, you know, don't appreciate. Diabetes, the same kind of thing. Yeah, insulin treatment is certainly required but there's a very, very important behavioral component. You have to change your diet. That's, an that's an, actually an essential component of treatment. Your diabetes will be wildly bad, poorly controlled if you don't change your diet as well. Right? How many people know someone or maybe is someone who struggles with diabetes? You know that there, there's behavior that goes with it, right? There are foods you have to avoid. There are things you have to change in your lifestyle. Obesity. We already know this one. That Diet and exercise is really probably the only uh, effective remedy for obesity, not drugs. So these are all medical ailments or medical problems and all have first line treatments that focus on behaviors, first line. And many well established behavior problems are brought on by behavior. We have this guy whose behavior is setting him up for a lot of medical problems. Uh, <laughs> approximately 90% of cancer cases can be attributed to environment and lifestyle. <coughs> That's only 10% are due to things like uh, heritability or other factors that are outside your control. That's an, that's an incredible rate. Um, and almost all cases of cardiovascular disease are due to behavior. So like our friend here who's on his way to a heart attack. Um, so very, very, very serious issues. Uh, I'm moving along at a pretty good clip here, so that's good. We'll have some time. We'll have plenty of time for questions, by the way. So how do you make some inf an informed decision? 
Um, <laughs> I wanted to get that. Thank you, Thank you man. <laughs> so, um, so some key questions that you should ask yourself in order to make an informed decision. First of all, can my child's problem or mine be treated with a non-medication approach? So a lot of people don't ask this question first, but you should. Remember what we said before about instant gratification? Medication is not going to be the pathway to instant gratification. Almost never. Um, and so you should ask this question, what else can I do instead? Think of your problem or your child's problem similar to how we might think of hypertension or diabetes. What are the behaviors that I need to change in order for this to improve? Um, if my child or myself still does need medication, can the dose be lower uh, if she or he receives some other non-medical intervention? So in other words, if it seems abundantly clear you're going to definitely need to do something about it medically, what are the other things that should be done? And there's a reason for that that we're going to get to. Uh, in a moment, but before that, so if me or my child needs medication, at what point can the dosage be reduced? So the reason I'm getting into this with dosage is that very frequently people assume more is better. If I do more of this medication, it will be better for my kid. Uh, and we understand that that is actually not necessarily true, and that stuff that I've said about side effects usually are worse with higher doses. So you always want to try and find what's the minimum therapeutic dose. Um, and you should also ask questions at the beginning like, at what point will we be able to talk about discontinuation of medication? Like, how long will this be necessary? So that comes to, that brings me to a list of some do's and don'ts about medication. And actually, they, I, I list them out as don'ts and do's. Uh, so don't assume that medication must be a life sentence. So a lot of times when you speak to people uh, who believe that they're going to have to take medication, uh, at least people ask me a lot, so this is an anecdotal comment uh, that I get asked is, um, will I have to take this now forever for the rest of my life? Uh, and that's, that's a tough assumption to live with. And the reality is that it may not be the case if some other measures are taken. So you should ask, do ask, what has to improve before dosage can be reduced and discontinued. What, do I ha what will have to be evidence to you, the prescriber, that would make you say, I do not need to take this any longer? And that's a question that people actually rarely ask. Uh, at least I haven't heard too many people ask that. Uh, and, and I'm more likely to hear that question even because they have a higher proportion of their time spent with me as a psychologist than they might with a medical provider. Don't assume that medication can be administered with limited oversight. So uh, again, there's an assumption that, oh, I've been taking this dosage of this medication for two months, and the dosage has not changed, and I don't feel any different, therefore I don't really need to go to the doctor. And that's actually not true. You should get regularly checked up, and you should probably even ask for a little bit more frequent visits than might be suggested by the psychiatrist. Psychiatrist might say, you know what, you don't need to come for six months. You might say, no, you know what, it'd be better if I came back in two or three. And I would, I would advocate for that as much as possible. Um, okay, so... Can you so, say different means improvement, or... Hmm? Can you say that you don't feel different, you don't feel improved, or you don't feel any change? Oh, well, I meant, um, I meant you don't feel, like, physical symptoms. Huh. Like, you don't feel side effects, you don't feel any kind of problematic effect from the medication, but maybe it's you're basically... Neutral. Huh? Neutral. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you should probably go more frequently to the medical doctor to get an examination and check into this. Um, so you should visit regularly and, and be familiar with the side effects. So the, uh, embarking on taking medication means really being acquainted with the side effects and knowing what to watch for. You really do need to uh, be attentive to this. Just as much as the advertisements are asking you to be a consumer, meaning you're going to ask the doctor if Paxil is right for you, um, you also <laughs> should ask uh, are these side effects ones that I'm going to tolerate? And what are those side effects anyway? Uh, could you give me like a really good rundown on that? Don't assume that the problem is biological. So as we've laid out here, uh, there are very good reasons to think that the problem may not be biological. Or, even if it is biological, maybe there are things that could be done without medication anyway because of all the biological problems that we know are treated non-medically to begin with. So do ask what changes in behavior might improve the situation. So what would you have to do differently? Those are, those are very, big, um, very big issues to reckon with. I have two more 
uh, don'ts and do's to go through. <clears throat> so like I mentioned before, don't assume that the higher dose means that you're going to have better outcome. Uh, that's actually generally untrue. Um, it's important to get a feel for what the minimal effective dosage would be for your condition. Now, it is true that most prescribing psychiatrists will practice in the following way. They will give a dosage of medication and they will continue to increase your dosage to some tolerable maximum. So that's, that's a known prescribing practice. And then they start to taper you down to what they would consider the minimum effective dose. So in good psychiatry practice, that's how it's done. Uh, so you want to be acquainted with that when you start. You should start asking those questions right when you get Why do they do that? So what, the reason that they do that is because um, they want to see at what point do you get the most benefit behaviorally from the medication. So sometimes it's hard to know, uh, and they'll go to a maximum dose, and they'll say, okay, this is as much improvement as you're going to get from the medication, and now we'll taper you down to a level that you're not going to have any loss of uh, or, or worsening of symptoms. Yeah, well, so the, so the process is done that way because um, psychiatrists also recognize that the medication will not be the cure. There's, there's an understanding, and the data really bears this out. So again, what I'm about to say, not in the least bit controversial if there was psychiatry in the room here to uh, you know, comment, is that uh, the effect for medication does not lead to dramatic outcome. There is outcome and improvement, but it will not solve the problem entirely. They, and that's widely recognized. Uh, if you were to go to a psychiatry conference, they would talk about this. Um, don't wait until your next appointment to inquire about possible dosage reduction. So when you're there, you know, ask the doctor, um, how are we doing? How close are we to when I might be able to uh, have my dose reduced? It's a worthwhile thing to ask about. Uh, ask for an earlier appointment if your symptoms seem to be reduced and stable. <clears throat> so if it seems that you're doing pretty well and you go, wow, my appointment with my doctor is not for another four months, but I'm feeling good and it seems like things are not really changing, let me ring them up and see if I can come in sooner. That's actually a really good idea to do. Um, how are we doing? Wow, okay. So um, I have a lot of time left for questions. I want to make sure it was informal. But before I do, so I have uh, some former students of mine are here. And so I always tell people to do this, a little shameless self-promotion. Uh, and so it is shameless. Uh, this is just some stuff that I've been doing lately. Uh, this is where my uh, research takes place at Fordham. Uh, I currently have two uh, treatment trials that we're working on, one for a condition called misophonia, which is um, an intolerance of certain sounds. It's, getting, it's kind of like uh, trendy, if you will. Um, and the other is for trauma associated with obsessive compulsive disorder. And um, I drove here from my private practice in White Plains, so I hope that you're impressed that I drove here from White Plains today. Uh, so if you're familiar with that route, by the way, at uh, leaving that office at around four, uh, you should be impressed, more so than with anything I had to say here tonight. Uh, so with that, thank you, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. I have ample time for questions, which is what I, I wanted to make sure that there was plenty of questions. Yes? Your clinical work, how do you treat medication with the people that you see for therapy? So um, in my practice right now, there are uh, several psychiatrists in Westchester that we uh, work with regularly, and those doctors kind of know what to expect when it comes to clients that, that myself or other members of our group are treating. And, um, and we regularly talk to them about what will lead to uh, what we refer to really more about patient satisfaction. Because that's really what this ends up coming down to. If you're taking medication for a very long time, then your satisfaction with outcome is probably going to be poorer. And so this is all about thinking about how will the consumer best benefit from this and be happy with the outcome. Uh, and so I end up speaking with the uh, client very frequently about these very same issues. And then I will let the psychiatrist know, especially if it's someone new, I'll say, listen, you know, I met with so-and-so that you're working with, and they're going to come in and talk to you about uh, this medication. What are your thoughts about this? And so I, I regularly have that discussion. Yeah. How do psychiatrists respond to that point you have that? Um, so I've had, actually, in general, I've had pretty, pretty favorable, uh, you know, interactions with psychiatrists around these issues. I mean, you know, not everybody's going to be that happy with me sticking my nose in their business this way. But, um, but the reality is that we're both engaged in treatment with the same client, and uh, I'm probably going to... You can't dismiss, right. you're not, 
your session didn't dismiss the work of psychiatrists no. completely. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, your, definitely not. Yeah. Sign. yeah, no, I, I appreciate you putting that. Yeah. The, the change in behavior, mm -hmm. and they are going to do the, the medication. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So if, if, if my sense is that the client is uh, feeling reluctant to ask some of those questions that I went through that I'm encouraging people to ask, then I'll ask for them. And I'll, you know, I, I'll try to be as deferential as possible and say, look, you know, what do you think about this? It's, I always go to, what do you think about this because my client says that they're doing well on this. Or it seems like what I'm observing because I've seen them this week and I know that they came to you about a month and a half ago. You know, so I would maybe play that card of the time lag when I saw them versus when they saw them and say, well, I'm observing this, you know, what do you think about this change? And then, you know, th so that makes it a little bit more um, collegial in terms of how things will go for the discussion. So, I think you had a question in the back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you explain again the reason for why psychiatrists first start out with the maximum medication and then go down? I understand yeah. you said it's to see the, like, the optimal behavior that could come out right. of it, but using other approaches, non-medical approaches, could enhance that sure. you know, optimal behavior even more. So what's the yeah. idea of starting with the maximum medication? Right, so, um, so there are a lot of factors that go into this, but at the most basic level, um, let's say someone comes in, they need medication, you start giving them medication, and they come back for their next visit, whenever that might be. So early on in the going, usually visits are more frequently. Um, they come in again, symptoms are, let's say, 25% improved. So that's still the 75% room for growth. Okay, we got to give a higher dose. Assuming that there's no other intervention going on, higher dose. Okay, we add, come back for the next visit, higher dose. Okay, now you're 40% improved. Well, you still have 60% room for growth. Okay, so let's keep going. You get to a point where maybe 50% improvement, but you also go, listen, doc, the side effects are really bugging me. And then they'll say, okay, well, that seems to be where our limit is. That's the highest that we can tolerate. Now you've gotten somewhat better, let's try and bring it down to a dose that <coughs> will not lead to a worsening of symptoms, but where it will be uh, tolerable with the side effects, minimum dosage, and uh, maximum efficacy for symptoms. So that's really the philosophy so that even, underlies it, right. assuming no other intervention. So even though they're trying maximum, they're gradually getting to the maximum and then working with that. Yeah, they oh, don't yeah. start automatically with like a very oh, no, large no. dose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually, yeah, nobody would do that, for sure. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. In teaching high school girls for 40 years, okay, we have seen the ADHD, ADD, right? Yeah. Uh, the necessity. There have been many cases where the parents rejected giving the kids medication at 14. Mm -hmm. At 18, their child snapped with irreversible damage. You know, it was, had they taken at earlier, smaller doses or at best. And I agree that the other behavioral changes, because that has to go, that's no question. But the fact is, they, there is a very drastic amount of people that are symptomatic of ADHD much more than I mean in the classroom it just changed it, it, it did change mm -hmm. now I understand the whole world change and the sensory and all that the fact is that they can't function they can't open a book yeah and we can't expel them from school because right. they have to sit in school well you know and, and, and I guess has to pull the the, the, the school and yeah. said that they are a medicine after the school forced them to get evaluated yeah. and they didn't take and the symptoms didn't change the behavior didn't change and they just you know well there's a little bit of a broader cultural issue and we you know it's kind of beyond the scope of our discussion tonight but um, the other issue that we wouldn't really want to second guess history is that there may have been other interventions that could have been put in place sooner before, before. things got to a breaking point there could have been some preventative measure and that you know that's a reality that uh, needs to be reckoned with for a lot of problems, not just ADHD. And if the medication, if you don't see improvement in how many weeks <coughs> does it mean that they maybe didn't diagnose it right? Because that happens a lot of times. Yeah. The kid is diagnosed with medicine, it's, there's no improvement, so obviously it's not hitting the right Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it varies from doctor to doctor in terms of how they deal with that. I mean, when I consult with psychiatrists who are uh, grappling with this, you know, really there should be some observable improvement after three to four weeks. Okay. That really, I mean, really, three to four weeks. yeah, like if it's not happening after a month, then there's probably something not going right. 
That doesn't mean the diagnosis is incorrect. Uh, it may mean that something else has to change, though, in terms of the treatment plan. So that's you know where some reassessment should be happening. If there's good continuous engagement with treatment, then I'm really brushing with the broadest stroke, but that I think would be probably a decent rule of thumb. You don't Go. expect improvement till four weeks. Oh no, no, you could see improvement before that for sure, and I, I would say the lack of improvement after four weeks at 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 the latest is where there should be some reevaluation. Yeah, Doc. Um, do you have any sort of situations or diagnoses where you feel that medication is actually contraindicated, not necessarily not helpful, but actually is actually detrimental to the treatment or outcomes? Um, panic. I think it's not helpful. Um, I actually, for most conditions that call for exposure-based treatment, uh, there are some. There's a class of medications that I'm not excited about people getting, uh, mainly uh, the so-called anti-anxiety medications like Xanax, Clonopin, mm -hmm. things like that, um, because it suppresses the degree of um, reaction that comes with doing exposure therapy. Mm -hmm. So I'm not excited about that, and I will, I will speak to psychiatrists and ask them to discontinue that medication, that class of medications if there's somebody that I'm seeing who comes in taking it on a daily basis and not on an as-needed basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I, that's a conversation I regularly have, by the way. Yeah. So I've, I've actually got like a whole rap <laughs> on how I get into that discussion with uh, doctors about the anti-anxiety uh, anti medications. Um, yes? I guess on the 180 to that question, there are some meds sort of for certain diagnoses, I assume, keep the stable baseline which you need, so sort of the like, once they reduce, are there some diagnoses more than others that you support long-term? Maybe not for children necessarily, but for adults you support long-term medication use? Um, so this is where I may I may seem a little bit more radical in my perspective. I don't uh, have anything. one that I can think of at all. Uh, I would only really think of it on a case by case mm -hmm. basis. So if there's somebody who seems to be a true treatment non-responder, then maybe that would be an instance where um, a much more long term uh, or maybe permanent level of administration might be called for. But it's it's actually fairly rare that I end up advocating for. Um, you have a question? Yeah. I just, it's more of a question about the research for mm -hmm. your specific mm -hmm. practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from what I have understood, I didn't do it myself, but what I've heard is that a lot of the, these clinical trials, when they've compared medication to um, therapy to both, usually it's the both that works the best. Yeah. Um, so I guess to some extent, you walk out of the speech and feel like, well, you know, therapy is, is fine and only use medication if it's really necessary. Yeah. yeah. But to some extent, if, if the, my question is, does the research really point paint that picture that really both is the most effective yeah, yeah. or not? So up until November, I thought that. I felt that the research con you know, conclusively supported the idea that combined treatment was the most effective way to go. Uh, I've now come to feel, based upon the methodology that's used, that we don't know. And the reason why I say that is because um, in a treatment trial, so you're getting therapy and you're getting medication. That means you're meeting with the therapist regularly and you're meeting with the psychiatrist every week. And that meeting with the psychiatrist is not merely uh, for a minute or two, right? That's a pretty extensive meeting. It's almost like an additional therapy session. In actual practice, that is not at all how it goes. So, like, I have clients right now who are uh, on medication. You know, any, any practicing clinician has some proportion of people that they treat who are on both medication and seeing them. Uh, they don't get that at all. So I don't think the comparison has been done to adequately test whether or not that's the case. So, um, so I'm not going to say that it doesn't support it. I'm going to say that we really don't know. Yeah. There's no two people alike. Well, that's true, but so, we have to, we have to ultimately work for the most general finding and, and, and then work and our way backwards. Like you, you said, that they should be the the um, side effects. We wouldn't take any familiar. medicine ever, nor Tylenol, if you read. And some people, once they read it, they feel it. Well, that's true. There are a lot of placebo effects, but oftentimes right. people don't feel are are probably not adequately educated about side effects, just in general, yeah. you know. And so it's worth knowing, you know, Steve. To your question, I would say if you took the two biggest, longest, most well-funded multi-site clinical trials, the MTA study for ADHD mm -hmm. and CAMS for anxiety in, in youth, 
the results at the end of the initial study look like combined treatment is better or that medicine only is better than behavioral like in the MJ study. And then if you follow these trials out after five, six years follow-up, the results always sort of regression to the mean. Mm -hmm. So it's less impressive. And this is coming from me, from somebody who is as pro-medication as any hardcore behavior therapist as I know. So I, I would certainly agree with you that there's a, a big delta between mm -hmm. what's done in trials and then what's done in practice. Yeah. I remember years ago at NYU talking with somebody who was a pharmacologist in the MTA study. Mm -hmm. And I took about the difference between medication and behavior therapy. She said, it misrepresents what we did to call it medication. It, it was psychopharmacology at its best in a way that nobody could replicate in private practice right. or, or would. Right, right. And I think that's the point you're making. Mm -hmm. It is, exactly. Yeah, it, it is exactly. Well, that and also, um, so the point that was made to me was that um, there needs to be an additional comparison condition uh, where there is the additional uh, placebo level contact with psychiatry uh, in the medication plus therapy group that they don't do. It would be really phenomenally expensive to include now yet one more yeah. comparison group in a treatment trial that's already probably going to be a few million dollars to conduct. And so uh, that's where there's that gap methodologically. Um, but statistically, yeah, the, the trend line does tend to kind of moderate out over the long term uh, in a lot of these things. But I was getting at the methodology issue. Just to support yeah. that also, there's also research where people going to, the, to a psychiatrist, that the therapist effect of the psychiatrist is sometimes or often bigger than the effect of the medication. Yeah, sure. So yeah, that's yeah. why I'm you know, seeing that. Too. Yeah, yeah. The psychiatrist is not just a medication dispenser. You know, it's not. You know, which you could maybe study in a more pure way if you were looking at, let's say, the efficacy of Advil, right? Because most people don't take Advil by first saying, "Oh, you know, I have a headache. I should go to the doctor." <laughs> when you talk to the doctor first, is Advil right for me? You know, and now they take Advil. Uh, most people just go, "I think I need Advil." They go to the doc, you know, they go to the drugstore, and so there's no therapeutic exchange with the cashier. Um, you know, maybe <laughs> anti-therapeutic. Has, has cases. a lot of double-blind <laughs> testing. And neither the patient nor doctor know what the person. Is. Well, yeah, there's a lot of talk about the degree that people accurately guess which condition their patient was in when there's a double-blind. Um, uh, is that successful? <coughs> uh, yeah, I, I understand that they've done a lot better with checking for the degree that the blind work. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I'm a little bit out yeah, of my realm, work frankly. For some people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The placebo effect is actually increasing, by the way, in general, for all things. Uh, the trend line for the last 30 years is that people are more and more likely to respond to a placebo, just for everything. <laughs> yeah, it's like really striking. There was an article in the Journal of American Medical <laughs> Association like four years ago documenting the upward trend in placebo effect. I guess someone hasn't asked it yet. Um, so you, you said repeatedly that, you know, every, when I'm saying now, oh, I don't think a psychiatrist in the room would disagree with. So right. I'm curious, are, what are the, are there areas that you think if you had a psychiatrist in the room that you would, he or she would have a disagreement with you about? So I think um, probably they would disagree with the philosophical statement that um, these are not or are brain level diseases. So like my position, I didn't really state it definitively, is that I don't believe that there is a basis for saying that it's a brain disease that can be identified in some specific neural region. Uh, and I think psychiatry would disagree with that. In fact, I know they would uh, because right now, the official policy of the NIMH, the uh, funding agency in this country, uh, with what they refer to as the research domain criteria is that they say, we now define mental disorders as diseases of the brain. That's their opening statement as an assumption. Uh, so that's something that I think is a, a very difficult proposition to demonstrate, at least not with the technology we have right now. Um, and so I think that's a point where there would be pretty strong disagreement. Um, I think there would also be some disagreement in the percentage of effectiveness. So there is agreement in psychiatry that medication does not, um, let's say, fully cure conditions that they are coming to treatment for. Um, when you look at the data on this, the proportion for which that effect is there, I think there's some disagreement in terms of how I read the data versus how uh, psychiatry might read the data. And I'm, I'm probably not a good person to speak to that, though, because I'm not a psychiatrist, so it's, uh, you know, I, I would appear as a biased source. Um, but I think those are some of the things that would be bigger disagreements. But the genetic data, without a question, so, you know, if you 
walked in here thinking, well, there are some psychiatric disorders that are absolutely genetically based. Um, I'm here to tell you that we really don't have that information. And, and, and there have been efforts to test it that have not borne fruit. So what do you do with all those twin studies and all that research? I don't know why I guess. I don't know. I don't know what you do with them. I mean, they're not, they're, they're not demonstrated. So here's the issue. So let's say um, one of the big neurotransmitters that we talk about is serotonin, right? Serotonin is attributed to a lot of psychiatric conditions. And so when they test genetically whether or not um, the genes associated with serotonin would be more likely associated with psychopathology, they fail to find that. They do find genes that are associated with psychopathology, but we don't have psychiatric theories that would suggest that those genes would be part of psychopathology. So there needs to be some revision of how psychiatric disturbance is conceptualized at a biological level. That's, I, and so I think that's really what has to happen there. And, and this was the, the topic of a discussion of panel that I was on at ADAA a couple of years ago. Um, so it was myself and another psychologist and two psychiatrists, and we had a debate about the validity of the biological perspective on psychiatry. And that was the discussion point that they ultimately agreed. They said, you're right, we actually have theories of psychopathology that are faulty when it comes to the biological model. And we know this because the gene studies that, there, there is one genetic study that was done where it was with almost 35,000 participants for depression and they failed to find a gene associated with depression. 35,000 people. That's a lot of people, right? That's enough that you would probably want to say, yeah, you know what, we really demonstrated this pretty clearly. Um, so with that level of non-support, you know, you have to think about going back to the drawing room. And so, you know, that's you know, part of why there are no new psychiatric medications in the pipeline for the public. There hasn't been a new one in years. Uh, and if you go to so again, something that I heard come out of a psychiatrist's mouth, there has not been a new discovery in psychiatry in almost 50 years. Not, not one that's really translated into something that's used in treatment. So maybe, maybe there does need to be some new theoretical perspective taken on it. Well, you do see in family, I'm sorry. That's okay, go ahead, finish your thoughts. You do see, what would you attribute? You would say that this is, you see in families tendencies that people suffer from anxiety and depression. Yeah. You would blame all of that on behavior and environment? Yeah, you, you could learn it. I mean, it's definitely yeah. learnable kind anxiety of stuff. Anxiety and... Uh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> no, I guess we're running out of time. <laughs> it's like at a buffet or a banquet. Oh, it's time to leave, you know? <laughs> so, yes, you had a question. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, you said earlier that if there was any disorder that you would advocate against medication for, it would be the anti-anxiety medication, like Xanax, for exposure therapy, and possibly that that's diminishing the exposure therapy? Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit on your perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, so let's say if, if somebody's taking a medication like Xanax, which uh, dampens your uh, adrenal response, it dampens your uh, anxiety response, because it's a sedating agent. And my job in doing exposure therapy is to, in a structured and guided way, practice getting you in touch with the things that you might be afraid of. Xanax is gonna interfere with that process, right? If you come to the office or you're regularly taking Xanax and then, let's say, let's say panic, right? I treat panic very frequently and one of the things that we do in panic is we try to provoke, in a very limited and fairly controlled way, panic symptoms in the office. Uh, how am I going to have that lead to a beneficial effect if the person is not going to actually so-called feel it because they've been taking a, a medication like Xanax. So, I, like I said, I've had that conversation regularly. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, there's somebody I started seeing recent, recently who was taking clonopin, so in that same class of drugs, and I spoke to the psychiatrist and said, I'm about to start doing exposure with this person. Um, would you consider discontinuing clonopin use? Uh, I've spoke to the client. They're prepared for it. Are you okay with this? The person said they were fine with it. And then that allowed us to do exposure. Now, the prior person that this uh, individual was seeing um, was also doing exposure, but did not make that request, and treatment was not helpful. So, you know, I'm hoping that it'll be helpful this time. Based on the first go round, it seemed like the person had a positive response, so, you know, it's a story in the telling, but this is something that is a routine discussion that I've had with people. That's the only class of medication that I really feel that way about, by the way.
Um, yeah. Yep. Just piggybacking off that question. So in your clinical practice, um, I assume you probably encountered people who have a firm like belief that it's the medication that perhaps is enabling them either to encounter the exposure yeah. and get through it, or they just like, I need this, even if in your like expert or professional opinion, or even in the psychiatrist's professional opinion, they really don't. And how would you, if you have encountered that, or how have you in the past? I um, have, yeah. How have you? Well, I mean, it requires some discussion about, you know, possible other causes, and it's a little bit of a lengthier conversation. I know it sounds like I'm kind of copying out on your answer, no, but it is, um, it's something that requires a little bit of discussion about other ways that things are, you know, other things that the person might have done that were beneficial that could have been done with medication. So, you know, sometimes, I like to refer to things like headache as a common one, like you don't always take medication for headache and yet it goes away, and so what did you do to make it go away? Uh, so I use that as an example. Sometimes I use, I like to use dental examples, like teeth come up frequently for me with people, so there's like dental comparisons that I use. Um, but usually for something like that, I would go to headache uh, as a comparison because that person probably has had experience with that uh, where they didn't take medication and experience where they did. And so then that starts to weaken the association that, oh, yeah, it's definitely the medication, or it might be something else. So, yes, Julie. Um, I guess with a patient, who isn't necessarily showing, just to also piggyback off that, um, who isn't necessarily showing too many side effects to the medication, but they seem to be doing well yeah. uh, in therapy and stuff like that. Like, is there like a principled reason to take them off medication even if like the practical like scenario doesn't show any negative effects? Yeah. Well, so um, my understanding is that if someone shows minimal or no side effects, uh, in the view of psychiatry, then that would mean that the medication is probably not appropriate for them. You're actually supposed to have some side effects. Uh, and the reason why is the side effects are uh, associated with targeting neurotransmitters. So, you know, when you target a neurotransmitter, it has the emotional or behavioral effect, but there's also the known side effects. And so if it's not happening, that means it's not targeting, it's not hitting it in your system. And so that conversation probably would have come up already with the psychiatrist before you had to worry about it. Now, in the event that that didn't happen, and the person's clearly doing well, and the medication seems to be not necessarily helping, or they seem to be doing really well, and they're still on medication, then it's worth having the discussion about maybe discontinuation. And, and that's a great conversation to have. You know, when you get to that point, that's beautiful. You know, that's like the goal, you know. Yes? Um, like in your clinical work, where do you, um, where do you find our the areas that you feel people overuse medication, like which which symptom areas you feel like there's an overuse that yeah. you usually that to practicing clinicians should be like an alert, like okay maybe too much is being used here. Like what are some areas that yeah. typically are over right right like diagnostic categories? Di yeah, diagnostic like that. categories. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I find panickers are frequently over on medication more frequently, and and the reason for that actually is because usually they're the first place they go. People with panic and, and anxiety disorders in general, the first place they usually go are the emergency room or to other medical professionals. And when it's at that level of acute distress, people generally get medication. And, and again, that's, there's a good reason for that. You're in the emergency room, right? You're in the emergency room and you're getting an EEG because you thought you were having a heart attack. Um, yeah, the, the doctor seeing you might say, oh, you know what, dude, you really need a Xanax. Um, you know, there's a very high probability in that setting that that's gonna happen. And so, you know, patients really would then recognize this, oh, this brought me relief, and so that's, that's the class of, uh, of conditions that are very likely to get medication when it might not have been necessary. Uh, and the research shows that medical utilization for anxiety disorders is very, very high, um, and maybe needlessly so. Like, it, like an incredible cost burden on the um, medical system related to anxiety disorders mm -hmm. and depression. So that's the one category, I mean, just anecdotally in my practice, we see a lot of kids, uh, and right now kids, you know, a kid comes into your office, there's a good chance they're taking a attention deficit-based medication. Like just the odds are very much in favor of that happening. Uh, to what extent is that essential every time is a question that I have because I don't think that people really assess for that so carefully in other medical offices. So those, those are the two. So I, I think yeah. Regine approaching the podium <laughs> suggests that we're out of time. Uh, so. Um, so yeah, thank you all for coming. I want to thank 
Dr. McKay for um, giving a wonderful presentation. Thank I you. also want to thank Manny for translating it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, third, I just want to say thank Malka and Hadar for organizing this today. It's really because of them that everything got off the ground. So thank you all for and feel free to hang out, ask questions if you're so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some housekeeping. <laughs>